Hi, so I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, what we do at NDSSL. I think it's something of a mystery to, to some people who don't know us so well. Uh, okay, where's the arrow? On the keyboard. On the keyboard. Thank you. Um, as Manav said, we, we try to influence policy by providing evidence-based support for decisions. And uh, this involves working with policymakers who, even more so than biologists, have never seen a command line prompt in their life. Um, and the, the kind of evidence base that we try to provide is based on the science of these interacting massive systems that are, have no particular symmetries or homogeneities in them. And uh, the best word, I th think, to describe them is just messy. Even though we don't have a wet lab, we work on really messy stuff. Um, we, we have put together or evolved, really, a multidisciplinary team, so team that works on transdisciplinary science. Uh, and we're focused on building synthetic information tools that decision makers can use. And we're driven by real world problems that our stakeholders define themselves. So, what do we mean by synthetic information? This is a, a, a way of modeling systems that we have kind of inherited from our longtime colleague, Dick Beckman, who, who gave us a push in this direction when we were, we were working on transportation systems. Synthetic information is a representation of a system that tells you a lot of statistically correct uh, associations within the system. It's not that we're trying to take a snapshot of the real world and put it into the computer somehow so that everything that you see out there is, can be referenced to something in here. It's trying to identify the most relevant aspects of a problem and capture the, the, uh, the statistics of them. Uh, we, we work a lot with populations, so we talk about synthetic populations, but these could be populations of anything, not just people in places, but cells or cytokines. We call it synthetic because it's both synthesized in the sense of built from, from other parts, and it's, uh, it's fusing a whole bunch of, of incommensurate data. So big data is something that we've been living for, for 20 years. Whatever was big at the time, we were in the middle of it. Uh, and it, it's more than just a lot of data. It's data that was never meant to work together. And when we create synthetic information systems, we try to find ways to make that data work together and, and provide insight into the system dynamics. Uh, another way to think of this that, that Chris likes to, to, to describe is this is a coordinate system for adding more data. So if you have, for example, a synthetic population, and then you find out something about uh, risk factors that you think might be useful in, in personalized medicine, you can add those the information about those risk factors onto the synthetic population that you already have. So it's like a coordinate system for, for adding information. Um, all of this relies on the ability to, to, to represent causal mechanisms at work in very complex interacting systems. And I'm going to describe socio-technical systems, but this is not uh, a, a real restriction in what we do. So you can think of, of individual behaviors. And we spend a lot of time in reductionist science trying to identify how things work when you pull them apart. But as has been mentioned several times this morning, what really matters is how those individual behaviors operate in the context of whatever is going on around them. You find that when you really represent all these, the, the context as well as the individual behaviors, you get collective phenomena that emerge at all kinds of different scales in the system. And that you have feedback between the, the large scales and the small, the long time scales and the short time scales, the large spatial scales and the short spatial scales. And this is what makes the system so complex. The challenges in, in understanding a system like this are uh, uh, figuring out how to take the data that's available and match it to what you really need to know about the system at different scales, different, uh, uh, different kinds of data. Um, figuring out the challenge that we're presented with by decision makers is typically, I have limited resources to, to affect changes in this system. How do I do it? What's the most efficient way to control the system with the limited resources that I have? Um, we find that we have to work on very large systems 
uh, trillions of, of interacting entities. Uh, we, we have constraints on the kinds of experiments we can do. In social systems, it's obvious. You can't just reach into a social system and do a, a, a RCT, a randomized controlled trial. Um, we need to understand how to extract information from natural experiments about uh, hypotheses we, we might generate. Uh, and then the, the, the ones that everybody has issues with who has anything to do with modeling, which is distinguishing causation from correlation, quantifying the uncertainty and the results that we get. So I'm going to describe this, what I just talked about, in the context of uh, one particular study that we did. Uh, the most of the lab was involved in this over the course of uh, half a year or more, which was a, a, a terrible catastrophe in downtown Washington, D.C. It's a, it's a bomb going off. And the way this has been studied in the past has been to produce a picture like this. This is pretty much the end result of most other studies. So there's a plume of nasty stuff coming out of the, of the explosion area, and there's physical damage all around it. And you look at this and you say, well, that's terrible. But what we pointed out was that you can, what you do after that event has very little to do with the, the physics of what caused the event. It's something about the social systems, how people behave. And what you want to do to mitigate casualties is to, to manage people's behavior after the event. So for example, we, have, we look at the individuals that are involved in the event. Here's a household, Alice and Bob and their, their child, Carol. And it's, it's simple things like, where are they all when this thing happens that influence the decisions that each of those people make? And the, the decisions that they make, I've listed some on the right, are the things that, that, that drive how those people come into contact with your efforts at mitigation, um, what, what resources they'll need, um, and eventually how many, what the casualties will be like. So this is just one household. And what happens when you put all the households together is that you get these collective phenomena that, are, that you have to understand if you want to be able to effectively mitigate damage in an event like this. So it's, the question is, how do we take this understanding of how the, the, the micro-scale dynamics placed in context create macroscopic phenomena, how do we align that with the responses that we're making and trying to control the system? So like I said, we're not restricted to working on social systems. I can make the same picture. It doesn't come out terribly well, but um, this is work that we've done with the, the NIML lab, Joseph's lab, um, where we, we, the entities that we're representing are different. They're cytokines and cells in the immune system. The interactions are completely different. And it's, it's kind of easy for me to make a picture like this. But what I want to try to, what I don't have time to do, but what I'd like to convince you of is that we can we can actually make this analogy precise and use the tools that we develop in one area for the other because it's all based on a, a mathematical formalism, a theory of interacting systems that's both computational and mathematical. So things that we understand about this system, high performance computing tools that we build for massively interacting systems can be applied in both these arenas. Um, and it's when we put the two together, the, the synthetic information systems and the simulations, that we, we get insight into the problem. This probably doesn't want to run. Uh, so those were movies that, that don't seem to be wanting to run, that, that demonstrate how simulation, together with, uh, with the synthetic information, gives you insight into what's going to happen in, in systems as complex as these. We provide these things as tools to decision makers, policy makers, and they change the, the way the policy makers work. So instead of each person having their own particular view of what's going on, they can communicate through these tools. So I, I have some domain expertise and I'm going to make a change that I think is going to help control this part of the system. But in order to explain to other people what effect that's going to have in the system, we can, we can provide them with a tool that lets them look at the system in ways they're used to. 
Um, a, a wonderful example of this has been our work in Ebola over the last nine months now. Uh, and I, uh, we've, we've described this before. What I'm really proud of is that I think the, the um, information that we provided, the evidence for, for policy effects, has actually helped the response to Ebola. So that's what I'm most proud of. I'm also proud of the fact that we figured out how to do all this within the context of an academic environment. So that out of the course of doing this work, we ended up with letters in PNAS, Nature and Science, and, and publications in good places. Um, this is supposed to be a talk about history. I'm just going to flash this slide of other things, other similar studies that we have, we've done over the last few years. Uh, there's, a, there's quite a demand for this kind of work. Um, and then briefly just mention that these are areas that we think we have unique insight into and that we plan to be exploring over the next few years. Urban resilience, we've already put in some proposals with others on campus on, uh, related to urban resilience. Um, formalizing the, the information synthesis pro process. It's, it's become much bigger than just creating a synthetic population and we need to formalize what we're doing there. Uh, looking at multi-scale, multi-theory interactions, figuring out how to take advantage of the immense data resources that are out there but are very uh, hard to manage right now. Uh, we're building out a set of global synthetic information resources that we think will be uh, the, the foundational structure of our lab for the next few years. And we're incorporating our tools into ecosystems, ours and others' ecosystems, to make them more available to policymakers. And Keith will take over from there. Thanks. <clears throat> so I'm going to do a little bit more of the history part of things. Um, so I've joined um, Chris Barrett's group in Los Alamos in, at the end of 1998, so I'm going to start this history from around there. Um, that group was actually going for about five years before, um, before I joined. So in around 2000, the 2000-2005 time frame, um, we were running on a system called Rockhopper. It was um, about 80 uh, two-processor single-core nodes. Um, and we were doing um, Portland. It's kind of hard to, I guess it's not too bad. So up there. So each one of those little squares is a million people. So we had a couple million people running around. Um, and at the bottom, um, what Stephen would have shown is a picture of um, tran uh, transims output. So those are actually, each one of those is a car moving around, around the city of Portland. And putting that together, um, doing one of these simulation runs took um, weeks to do. <clears throat> um, arguably, you could call transims our first user accessible application. Um, I say arguably here because we didn't actually put this together. We put the, the back end together, all the models, and then had a commercial partner, which originally was PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, that division got bought by IBM, so ultimately it was IBM we were working with who put together a um, Java-based um, desktop interface to the system that were, was used um, by several MPOs, um, including Portugal. Portland Metro, who we um, worked with. So this is where we started. 2005, we came to, um, to VBI and started working here. Um, there we had um, two machines over that were added over those, um, those five years. They were a little bit bigger. Um, we expanded the population that we had to um, the city of Chicago, which was about 10 million people. Um, and at that point, we could do um, these simulations um, in days. Um, also, over that time, we added 
a system called um, didactic, which then was called ISIS, which we recently renamed to civil for obvious reasons. <laughs> <coughs> which is a web-based tool that was a, is actually used by um, decision makers that we're collaborating with in um, DITRA and other government organizations where they can sit down and run these big experimental designs, analyze the results, and actually have, um, have the, the, their results generated for them, which they can then use incorporate into their presentations and inform the decisions that they're making. Um, we're trying to get out of the role of somebody asking us questions, taking two months, developing a 100-page report, giving it back to them, they read it, and the first thing they said was, well, what if you did this? And then we'd have to go back and, and redo that cycle. If you give them the tools, they can do all those what-if questioning questions themselves. Um, over the next five years, we increased our computation um, quite a bit. Um, we have Pecos, which is um, still with us, and th the uh, beginning of Shadowfax. We added another um, tool, which was Cynet. So this is a, a network analysis tool where people can go in, look at different networks, and run um, about 50 different network analysis measures. To, um, to kind of understand what the, these social contact network, networks that we're creating, um, what the properties they have. And we moved up to um, both creating and running um, the, the population in the United States. So 300 million individual people. Um, these are synthetic people, so there's no personal identifiable, identifiable information in here. You can't find me in our population. What you can find is people like me in the same proportion that they're in the real population. So if you take a census of our synthetic population, it matches the, the US census that we use to create this. Um, and then where we are today, current shadow facts, over 3,000 cores. Um, so I don't know if you can make out the colors, but basically those two, one and a half of those top boxes up there is what we started out with um, 15 years ago. And that's actually not really a fair comparison. This is just counting actual physical cores, the cores themselves. Um, this is about a factor of three that you get just from um, the, the clock cycle. Another factor of five um, based on other improvements. So there's about a 10x improvement before, between a core that we originally had and the cores that we have now. So in the, the nodes on Shadowfax that we're currently in the process of deploying, one 32 core node um, there is about equal to all of the, the cluster that we're operating on in 2000. And we have 23 of those that we're adding um, in, um, currently. And within a factor of two or so, the, core, the node costs have stayed the same. So, so the computing power we have is greatly in increased. Um, today, in the middle there, we have many user-based applications. These are tailored to answer particular questions that um, that we've been asked by um, sponsors, by people within our lab, um, tailored to, to what they, they need to know and how they want to use the system. Some of them are very simple. Um, FE Viewer is just a way to, to look at multiple FE curves laid on top of each other. And that solves the problem um, that came up during our Ebola response where you had multiple labs around the world and multiple organizations presenting forecasts and ground truth and basically you would get PowerPoint or PDF. And there's n the scales were different, the, the times were different. There's no real easy way to compare these things other than put them side by side and try and make sense of them. So we developed a system where we would pull the data out of those, put it into our system. Somebody can log on to that, select the graphs they want to see, and they get overlaid on, on top of each other. 
Um, one of the recent features we added was a movie feature, an animation where you can actually see successive forecasts as time progressed. So you can see how people's forecasts um, changed over time. Today we have a population of about 800 million people um, covering 14 countries. Um, and like I said, those, those applications there. Um, uh, one, one thing I was going to say is the computing power that I've shown here is just what we have locally. We also um, use other resources at Virginia Tech, um, other national resources from NSF, um, DOE, DOD. Basically, as much computing as we can get, we can make use of. Um, and that runtime now is down to seconds. One of the things we've done over the past um, year or so, we did a, um, a study on a system called Blue Waters at um, NCSA. It has 320,000 cores on it, and we're able to um, simulate the entire population in the United States, so 300 distinct agents running around, interacting with, with each other, um, with uh, the flu spreading throughout this population in less than 30 seconds. So we've come a long way from weeks doing Portland, Oregon. Where we're heading is global population. <clears throat> and we expect to be there by the end of next year. So this is a, a project that's ongoing. That's where the, the 800 million came from as a partial step to our, towards getting that, that whole way. Um, Petascale computing, less, like I said, over 300,000 cores. Um, we're developing this app ecosystem. So instead of these individual stovepipe applications that don't talk to each other, they're all working on common data. Results generated in one app can um, be seen and used in other apps. So you can use Sybil to create experiments. You then can um, analyze the experiments through Cyanet. You can visualize the results um, from the forecasting tools in EpiViewer, um, et cetera. And we're creating platforms for others to build apps to add to this ecosystem. So um, we're in the process of building these software development kits so somebody who wants to use this data can put together their own app, tie into our system, get all the benefits of what's there, and tailor things to exactly what they want to do. Um, and this goes along with uh, loosely coupled interacting infrastructures, both the um, urban infrastructures, populations, transportation, telecommunication, public health systems, energy systems, as well as um, interacting cyber infrastructures. So ours, other people's, um, the NFS, NSF's um, exceed system, um, and then um, Samarth will talk about this a little, little more, but adding more complex and nuanced behavior to our system and integrating the both within skin, the uh, microbiome, genetics, proteomic stuff with the beyond skin stuff, how people move around, how they interact with, with people and the urban environments around them. Okay. And then um, Samarth will talk to us about this global synthetic information system. So I'm going to uh, talk more about where we're going. Uh, I'm going to focus in particular about on this topic called global synthetic information. This is something that we've really been focused on in the past year. And going forward, the next few years, this is really going to be uh, central to what we're doing. Uh, so like uh, Stephen and Keith uh, talked about, we started with Portland, Oregon, and then you know we did Chicago, and then for a few years now, We've had a complete representation of uh, the entire United States of America, so that's about 330 million people. Um, and then we're moving towards uh, global synthetic information. Right? So the goal is really to build out a complete representation of the population of the entire world. And uh, so this picture just shows you uh, which countries are sort of currently in, we are in the uh, data gathering stage and which countries we're in the population construction phase. 
And what's happened over the uh, past year is that, and past few years, is that we have focused a lot of effort on streamlining the software side of things, so optimizing our algorithms uh, and uh, automating them, and automating the testing and validation and all that, so that really now the effort is dominated by the data gathering phase. So now we have like a dedicated team of students. This is all they do. They go out and they gather you know, data about different countries. They speak multiple languages. They're brilliant. And uh, uh, they've really become good at this. Uh, because it's a difficult job. Because every country reports information in a different way. The same variable will mean different things to different people. right? And so the, a lot of the work here is in getting all this information synthesized and standardized so that we can run our software on it. And uh, it was fortuitous that we were engaged in this project because uh, when the Ebola outbreak came along, we were very well positioned to be able to respond to it. So uh, it primarily affected you know, three countries in Western Africa, so it's just a small part of this picture. Uh, but we really devoted a lot of effort into getting that representation right and getting it turned around very quickly so that it could be used as part of the uh, understanding of what was going on, part of the response effort. Um, so what I want to talk about, though, is what does this enable, right? So when we say we have global synthetic information, what does that mean? And what does that mean for us going forward? What kinds of problems can we look at? So often we say synthetic populations, but really it's much more than that. So uh, for one thing, there's demographics, so that's the people. But then we have a lot of information about interactions within the population. So what does this mean? It means that we have information about the activities that people do over the course of a day. We have geographical information about where people may live and where they work and where can, they can go to school and so forth, and so how they move around during a day. And we have information about, therefore, who comes into contact with whom. So this is information about interactions in the population. right? So that's sort of this picture on the, uh, on the top here. It's showing you, you know, people moving around and therefore coming into contact with each other. Uh, during the course of their daily activities. But in addition to that, we also have uh, models of uh, infrastructure. So infrastructure like transportation, or power, or communication, and that's coupled with human behavior. So this was one of the studies that Stephen briefly mentioned about the improvised nuclear device going off in Washington, D.C., uh, where we really put a lot of in effort into get figuring out the right representations of these infrastructures and how they interact with human behavior, right? Especially in the context of disasters. Um, and we learned a lot during that process. We don't have this level of detail for the entire globe. You'll, just the information isn't available. Uh, but this is something that we're heading towards at least at a smaller scale while we're building out the global population. Right? So uh, what does having this kind of thing enable, right? So <laughs> the main idea is that it allows us to look at global problems as global problems. So the simplest example, or not necessarily a simple example, but this is you know, what we do already. So this is just more of what we do at a global scale now, which is looking at uh, infectious disease pandemics. Right? So if you remember, uh, for example, the H1N1 pandemic from 2009, uh, it was called swine flu. It started in Mexico. Uh, and then within about six months, it had spread throughout the entire world. And six months is about the time that it took for people to sort of understand that there was a pandemic going on. So these things happen very, very rapidly, right? So you're never in a, really in a situation where you say, oh yeah, there's a pandemic going on and I can stop it at its source. Really you're focused on, well, it's a pandemic now, it's all over the world, what can we do? How can we coordinate efforts uh, to mitigate the effects, right? Um, and if we only look at some small part of the world, even if it's like the entire United States, you're getting only a very small part of the picture, and therefore your response is very limited. But if you can look at the entire globe, if you can model the entire population of the world, suddenly you have a lot more powerful tool in your hand to be able to address these questions. So, but this is you know, business as usual. What can we do beyond this, right? Uh, so we can look at all kinds of problems that involve interactions between people that involve policy, that involve society and culture, and environmental effects. Here's one example. This is a percentage of males smoking any tobacco product, right? And what has happened in the last 50 years or so is that tobacco use has shifted that way. 
right? So it used to be that in the US, if you go back to like the 1950s, if you watch Mad Men, right? Uh, it's like more than half the population smoked, like all the time, right? And now the numbers are down to like 15, between 15 and 20%. And there's a lot of variation within the US also, but if you look at the uh, Eastern countries, with China and India and Russia, the proportion of the smokers are very, very high. From the perspective of the tobacco companies, the entire world is their market, right? right? Uh, and what has happened in the West now is that uh, we have seen the rise of e-cigarettes, electronic nicotine delivery systems, things like that. And uh, there's a lot that's not understood yet about uh, how harmful they are or not, whether they help you quit smoking or they help you continue smoking. Uh, and it's really sort of the Wild West as far as uh, regulation is concerned. We don't really have any uh, regulations in place about who they can be marketed to, uh, who, can, who they can be sold to, who can use them indoors or outdoors or where, right? Uh, and so it's very helpful to be able to think about uh, so the global scale of this problem and how it interacts with uh, regulations and policy as well as social and cultural norms uh, in addition to the health aspect of it. Another example is if you look at uh, just the leading causes of death in different countries, right? And uh, you, what you'll find is that broadly speaking, you have developing world problems which are, have much more to do with infectious diseases and you have Western world problems which have more to do with chronic diseases, right? But that's an oversimplification because if you really pay attention, you'll find that there is a group of countries that are developing countries but have, so to speak, Western world problems, right? And so why is that, right? So it's, it, it's not such a simple question. So the answer is perhaps that it has to do with uh, a combination of uh, cultural effects, economic effects, and health effects, right? And so to be able to understand why exactly this is happening and how it's going to evolve in the future, it's important to be able to have a global picture, right? And the final example I'll give, uh, which is probably the most complicated one, is if you start looking at climate change effects, they will be different in different parts of the world, right? So you have rising sea levels and damage to coral reefs in some places, you have reduced crop yields in some places, but you have better farming conditions in other places. Uh, you have more unpredictable monsoons in India, and you have increased risk of malaria in Africa. So this is really a, a creeping change. We know it's coming, and in order to understand what we have to do, we have to understand how it will affect different parts of the world differently, right? Uh, so this is sort of a grand challenge problem. If you really want to understand how the world is going to look in 50 years, this is what you have to work with, right? And so this is where, this is sort of the direction we're going in with being able to represent the uh, population and interactions the world over. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you. We have time for uh, several questions. Um. So for your uh, population simulations, they seem pretty accessible. So uh, you know they could be used for nefarious purposes. What are your plans for security on those? Especially if people are able to develop their own apps to access the, the information. Um, we, is this on, or do I need yeah, to switch? Yeah. Yes. So, 10, 15 years ago, someone tried to stop our uh, epidemic simulation modeling because of exactly that. But if you think about it for a while, I think you can convince yourself that the, the benefits to understanding how to mitigate and control, uh, say, a disease outbreak far outweigh the pretty small likelihood that somebody could use this as a terrorist planning tool. Um, sometimes it's not quite so clear cut. For example, we're, we're working on a paper right now that looks at uh, targeted damage to the electrical power infrastructure and where there might be vulnerabilities in that. Um, those tools aren't necessarily, 
they're, they're more useful for us than they would be for someone trying to develop an attack because we know that this is a, it's a synthetic data information environment. If you planned an attack based on this, you'd be optimizing your attack in this virtual world that does not specifically mirror the real world. Whereas we can draw rules of thumb and lessons learned from those, those kinds of simulations that do apply in general to the real world. So, so that kind of brings up my second question, and that is how do you actually test your simulations to determine their accuracy in the real world? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, Stephen, <laughs> we, we actually forecasted this question would come up, so. <laughs> Chris, Chris calls it a general's question who can, you know, be at the back, not pay attention, and ask this very hard question that's very hard to answer. But I'll take a shot and maybe let others also take a shot. So I think the ability to understand these systems uh, in, in, the, in terms of making sure that you have validated it, if that's the word you want to use, is, uh, is much more complicated, but is doable. So the first thing to understand is that predictive validity is not the way we want to understand these systems. Physical systems certainly have been uh, ones where people have worked with predictive validity. So if you can reproduce a phenomena in exactly that form, then the system is viewed to be validated. Uh, it's only one part of the, of the story here. We have tried to actually build a program in which we have a fairly strong mathematical you know, program to understand the structural properties of the systems. We try to understand how the system is put together so that we have faith in it. We have certainly tried to do the predictive validity as well, but that turns out to be relatively easy to do. Uh, in fact, as you might have guessed, almost every paper we write on epidemic simulations, they want us to try to reproduce the old results. And it's actually fairly easy to reproduce a flu in 1918, if you so choose, but has very little to do with what's really likely to happen. So I think that's an exercise that you need to do to satisfy a reviewer, but actually does not have much of information content in terms of understanding. So there's a lot of functional validation that goes on, structural validation that goes on, and I think a particular class uh, of validation techniques that maybe not a technique as such, but an idea is putting this out in the field for users to use it. And when policymakers use this and make decisions over and over again with a tool like this, uh, we, have, we have much more confidence in its utility at the end of the day, rather than you know, just exercise with pen and pencil. So that's at least my answer, and maybe others. Um, I'll just add to that. Um, so when we construct a synthetic uh, information system, it's a multi-stage process. And what we end up with is a complex data structure, right? And so you can't uh, validate it just by trying to reproduce one sequence of numbers because there are too many parameters that you could tune. So really what we have to do is we have to validate it at every stage of the process in as many ways as we can, right? So when we just generate the demographics of the population, we have to validate that. When we add the activities, we have to validate that. When we uh, add the activity locations, we have to validate that. And so we've developed techniques for validating at each step of the process that we, what we're looking at is something sensible. So I can, I can point you to papers about that. Is there some method of feedback, like especially with the policymakers, to determine how effectively their policies work based on those simulations? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so one thing I want to point out is that at some point, you have to make a forecast about something that hasn't happened yet, right? So like we're looking at this uh, scenario called the National Planning Scenario 1, which is an improvised nuclear device going off in Washington, DC, right? It is something that they want to plan for. It has never happened anywhere in the US. So how do you validate it? And the answer is you can't. You just sort of have to make a prediction. You have to sort of you know, stake a claim at some point. And what you do is you say that, Here's everything that I'm using to make the prediction. Here's my whole model. It's public, and everything is validated within it. But since the event has never happened, you can't talk about validating that. That is my prediction. Right? And in fact, if you think about it, every time a flu season comes around, it's different. It's a different strain of the flu. It may come about in a start in a different place in the country and so forth. Right? So you want to be able to say ahead of time, this is what's going to happen, and validation only happens if that event actually happens, then you can compare your data with predictions. If, 
I'm going to keep talking because I think this is an important question. Um, another way to think about what we're doing is to make it plain to the user what the consequences of their hypotheses are and their assumptions about the system. In a complex system of many interacting parts, it's not always obvious if you say, well, I think this is what's driving something. If you put a driving mechanism in, you don't know what's going to happen. So in part, what we're doing is providing a way just to see what the, what the consequences of the hypothesis people have are. So it's, it, in that sense, as long as we can guarantee that this hypothesis would, in fact, lead to those consequences, then it's, it's really a tool that lets people do traditional sort of hypothesis ver validation experiments. It's like, we're, we're not saying this is what's going to happen. We're saying, if you think that's what the situation is now, and this is what's driving it, then this is what's going to happen. Because that's the, that's the piece you can get to with a causal model. So you can view this as a counterfactual like in silico laboratory, right? You can basically play out what-if scenarios with this. Rather than just talking about forecasting specific events, you're really trying to support the policymakers' uh, efforts in trying to understand what would happen if they take certain actions. And so far as these action, the, the specific decisions they take, take them in the right direction, in, in, in our opinion, that's actually a form of validation uh, that's very powerful in that in that particular setting. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to add add one thing about um, the Ebola response in, in in particular. So in the beginning, um, there were these very dire forecasts that said that millions of people were going to to get sick and die, and it that didn't it didn't turn out to be as dire as, as the forecasts. That doesn't necessarily mean that those forecasts were wrong because one of the reasons that it wasn't that dire is because people changed their behavior. And one of the reasons that they changed the behavior was because of these forecasts. So unlike physical systems, this is a case where just making the forecasts actually feeds back into the system and changes the system itself. Anyone else before we go on? <laughs> well, actually, I'll say something about that, and then I'll ask my question. That the one, the one thing that um, I think is really powerful about what you're doing is the transparency of how the assumptions and the behaviors are realized in the model, that it's not one of these big black boxes that you can't really see what's happening. So I'll just add that from some of my experience with these. But now my question. So I think it's great we're going to have the global population, you know, in a year. But you guys also talked about using this technology for modeling, you know, beneath the skin and above the skin. So how or what's our time horizon of connecting this, of actually being able to move from below the skin to above the skin and out to the world? Uh, I think uh, we're already starting to do that with Joseph, uh, where we started to connect, building out models for things below the skin. Um, we hope that we'll be able to connect it at a population-wide analysis, uh, you know, in an appropriate way. And maybe a, maybe a very coarse answer is when we get the funding to do it, <laughs> that we'll do this. <laughs> because at the end of the day, <laughs> that's what will determine <laughs> when we do this. Where are the sponsors when so you need them? We are ready for it. <laughs> I'm wondering about the major bottleneck for the predictive power of your models. So is it actually, do you really see still shortcomings in the models themselves, in the way how you build them? Or is it more like the data that you can actually get into the models? Or is it human behavior that's not perfectly understood and will suddenly go in odd ways that maybe are not incorporated? So where do you see the major problems in having the best models? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the important thing to understand is that in, it's not like in one year we'll be done. It's not like we're going to have the global synthetic population in one year and that's it and you know, it's all applications from there on, right? Because uh, we're always in a, a state of refining models, 
including you know, models about human behavior, uh, understanding about how policy impacts human behavior and human interactions and so forth. So there isn't one you know, particular bottleneck that's going to hold us back. Really, everything has to be sort of constantly updated. For one thing, the population changes over time, right? To, to make at least uh, give a positive side of the story, so okay, we are working with uh, another group at uh, Virginia Tech. Narain leads the project with IARPA, and we've been very successful in forecasting various social and health events. Uh, you know, we've taken lots of data, open data, commercial data, data that was hard to get, and used these models along with statistical models to do actually, a, I would say, the best, because there was a competition as it goes with any of these DOD-style projects, and we won the competition. So our forecasts are actually fairly good uh, from any, any meaningful comparative standards. Great. Well, let's take this opportunity to thank NDSSL again uh, for a really wonderful presentation and some nice, thorough answers. Uh